It's a delight to be back with you this last, uh, this last weekend. Miriam and I were in Los Angeles. My first time driving in Los Angeles, and and, uh, and we're back. We made it back. Yeah, we had a we had a we had a great time. Many of you know uh, that in in 2019 I started attending seminary. I was uh, able to start at the Master's Seminary through the Extension Campus here in Spokane. It's, uh, it's located at Faith Bible Church here in Spokane. And just this last week, I attended uh, my, my graduation. So a lot of my classes, well, really all, almost all of my classes, uh, apart from some that I tuned into from my own home because of COVID, but apart from that, uh, they were all in Spokane. And so uh, going down to LA was a, a a neat opportunity to, to see and in some cases to meet a lot of my professors for the first time while we were down there. So it was a sweet, sweet time together and uh, we're, we're, we're glad to be back. We accomplished our mission and we're, I'm now officially graduated, so that's, that's done and, uh, and we're, we're ready to, to, to keep going here. We've been really encouraged. You all have been uh, so supportive and we're thankful for your prayers and, and your support and we're we're, uh, we're, we're back, and we're here to keep, keep going in ministry together. Um, and uh, thanks to Jason as well for, for carrying on the torch last week of, of the ministry of the Word, of, of preaching the Word and proclaiming the Word. We are uh, this, in this special privileged position of being the, the, the called out people of God, and as part of that, we, uh, we have this delight and this duty to, to sit under the, the Word of God, to hear it taught, to hear it proclaimed, to be changed by it uh, week by week, day by day even. And so, uh, so this morning, we're continuing in the book of 1 John, just as we have been and as we'll continue to do so. We're in 1 John chapter 3, right where Jason left off. We'll be starting in verse 11. John is writing to believers, if you'll remember. Uh, he's, he's given us his main purpose in writing not every epistle does this. Most of the books uh, of the Bible don't give us such a clear uh, description of, of their specific purpose, but John does. He tells us plainly that these, he's writing these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. He's writing in order to help these believers in their assurance and to do so, he, he's describing to them the outcomes of those who have this changed heart, who are living a changed life. He's describing this clear difference between a child of God and a child of the devil. And what most clearly distinguishes the two is faith. We've seen that in the letter. We'll continue to see that. The most important thing about the children of light the most important thing about the children of God is that they have come to believe in the Son of God. I'm writing these things to you who believe, John writes. But faith itself has outcomes. Faith produces things. Saving faith in Jesus as a, as a gracious gift of Jesus, empowered and enabled by the indwelling Holy Spirit, foreknown by the Father, purchased by the blood of the Son, illuminated by the Spirit, saving faith will have an effect. And John says the effect of saving faith will be obedience. We've been looking at that chapter by chapter and verse by verse through this letter as he's giving us these different signs of obedience. Those who are in the light will walk in the light. Those who have the life live. Those who have faith, obey. And John summarizes obedience into two basic categories. We've seen in the first part of the letter an emphasis on keeping God's word. And now moving into the second part of the letter, the second major section of the letter, we're going to see an emphasis on love. Now in the last verse of the previous passage, the, the passage that that. Jason took us through last week, we saw these two categories even lined out. John wrote, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. 
And up and now, uh, and until now, John's been, he's been focusing on keeping God's commands. He certainly mentioned love. We've seen love uh, repeated, but the emphasis has been on, on, on uh, faithfulness, on keeping God's commands, on walking in the light. In chapter 2, he wrote that this is no new commandment, but that they are to love one another. And then he also writes that uh, while it is not a new commandment, yet it is a new commandment because that love is to be just like the love that Jesus has loved them. So this old yet new command, even to love as Jesus loves, brings us to our, our passage now this morning. 1 John 3, we're reading verses 11 through 18. 1 John 3, starting in verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We pray that you would shape us by it, that you would make the book come come to life in us. This morning, that you would shape us and move us, that we would respond in faithfulness to your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So John continues in this letter of assurance, and he he affirms in our passage this morning that true believers obey God's command to love one another, even as Jesus loved us with a love that is set apart and is sacrificial and is sincere. This passage continues in in this purpose of giving believers confidence. And at the same time, it should challenge all of us who who hear it. It should be uh, a challenge for any of those who who are not behaving in a way that is consistent with true belief. So to the unbeliever, a passage like this ought to be a a wake-up call. To the professor, uh, the professing believer, that is, whose works don't line up with their profession, this ought to be a real warning. And yet to those who are conducting themselves in a way that is consistent with their profession, with this new life in them, it ought to be confidence, and assurance. And whether this passage is a wake-up call or, or a warning to you or a sweet assurance to you depends, according to John, whether you are in Christ and whether you are obeying his commands. To love as Jesus loved. And the love we see in this passage with which Jesus loved us is a set-apart and a sacrificial and a sincere kind of love. We're going to use those three words to walk our way through this passage, which really pulls together a a description and a definition and a kind of roadmap for us of what this love is supposed to look like. True believers obey God's command to love like Jesus, with a love that is set apart and sacrificial and sincere. So first, verses 11 through 15. This love is to be set apart. Now, use that phrase. When you use the phrase set apart, you may uh, think of holiness. Often when we define holiness, we talk about something that is set apart for God's purposes. It's set apart to God. And in a way, we are called to 
holy love, a different kind of love, a love that is set apart from the love of the world. It's derived from a different source. It's directed at a different purpose. John describes the love of the world back in chapter 2, verse 16. He says, All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desire of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world desires to satisfy the lusts. Unbelievers are, are, are captive ultimately to their desires. When we're slaves to sin, when we're slaves to the flesh, we're captive to our own desires. And so whether it's greed and a desire to accumulate wealth and possessions and, and all kinds of status and, and toys and, and all, all of the, the gleanings and the accoutrements of, of a, a comfortable American lifestyle, or whether it's uh, gluttony and a desire to, to satisfy the flesh with, with food, whether it's with, with uh, exquisite tastes, or whether it's just with sheer volume and, and comforting oneself and medicating oneself with, with food, or whether it's pride, the pride of life, he says, with grasping and clawing for, for dominance and position, Whatever the, the, the satisfaction of the desires of the flesh, flesh takes shape as, the world is, is grasping for these things. It, and it may even be the more subtle desires, the, the, the nicer looking desires of, of feeling good about serving others. The world often does good things, and, and people can be involved in all kinds of philanthropy, of, of feeding the poor and reaching out and, and meeting physical felt needs. And, and that's a good thing to do. But the desire is still, is still seated in this, this desire to feel good, to feel like a good person. Or, again, maybe even more uh, subtle, it's, it's the, the desire to contribute to some kind of celestial moral bank account. Study a 2020 study conducted at Arizona Christian University indicated that some 48% of American adults believe that, quote, if a person is generally good or does enough good things during their life, they will earn a place in heaven, end quote. And I'm not entirely sure who the, who the, the set of people was that they questioned. I, I don't know exactly who they surveyed. I'm guessing this was a, a true or false sort of question on a survey, and, and of, of the American adults who were asked, 48% of them said yes. That if you just do enough good things, you will earn yourself a seat at the table in heaven. 48% of Americans are, are comfortable saying that, believing that. And that's the, that's the best version of this love of the world. Most of it is, as John just described, these lusts of the flesh, satisfying the desires of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, etc. So John begins this passage by reminding believers of what is distinct about Christian love, what they, what they heard from the beginning. What he, what he means by the beginning is the, the beginning of the gospel in their lives, when they heard what they, what they heard when they first heard the gospel and, and trusted in it and believed in it was that they should love one another. This was from the very beginning for them. And John begins here describing this different kind of love in this passage. And interestingly, now he starts describing that love, the love of Christians, with a negative example. So he gets to a positive example in just a minute. But he's starting with this example that, that, that goes all the way back to Genesis 4. Verse 12, he says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. So why Cain here? Of all the examples he could have gone to, of all the illustrations he could have made, there were some much closer to their immediate surroundings. He could have brought up, for example, Judas in his own lifetime, very near in the mind of John, could have been Judas who betrayed Jesus uh, and, and, and led him to his murder, contributed to his murder in that way. He could have pointed to all kinds of murderers throughout the history of Israel. He could have pointed to Absalom, David's son. He could have, he could have pointed to Abimelech or Athaliah, 
and that's just the A's. He could have, he could have, he had a whole slew of choices for murderers throughout the Old Testament. So why does he take us back to Cain? Well, the narrative of Cain, what happens with Cain, it takes us back to the first son of Adam. And not to be too obvious here, but Genesis 4 and and the narrative of Cain and Abel, it comes right after Genesis 3 and the narrative of Adam and Eve and the first sin. There's lots of parallels between the two stories because they're linked. Adam and and Cain are are connected and there's all kinds of examples and we won't go into all of them, but but just to to touch on a couple of them, when, when Adam and Eve sin, they hide themselves and God comes walking through the garden and he, he says, where are you? It's not for lack of knowledge, but God's drawing them out. He's drawing their hearts out to confess what they've just done. Likewise, after Cain had, had slain his brother, God asked him, where is Abel your brother? He's asking them these questions. Uh, Adam is cursed for his sin and God says, cursed is the ground because of you. And after Cain killed his brother, God says, you are cursed from the ground. See these repetitions in these two stories, how these two narratives right after each other are connected. Because it's the story of the Creator and His creation, this special creation, these these people that He's made in His own image who are made to glorify Him and, and, and their failure to do so. And it's not only Adam. The Adam, Adam was named uh, with the Hebrew word for man, Adam. This means the man. He's named after what he is. He's the first man. And when Eve gave birth to her first son in Genesis 4.1, she says, look, I've gotten a man. It's an interesting word choice. It'd be more natural to say child or son. But she says, look, another man. Right? The, 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 it's, it's continued now. It's man. It's a line of men. And what we see really early on in chapter 4 is what's the same about them now. Adam, in that first sin, has now passed his iniquity onto his very first son, another man, who's now risen up against his brother. This business with Cain brings that reality clearly into our minds. Cain Cain was a worker of the ground, just like his father. There's no normative statement in here about that, so you don't need to worry about farming. Uh, the, Genesis 4 doesn't tell us that there's anything bad about farming. He was a worker of the ground, just like his, just like his dad. And it doesn't say that Abel was, was more righteous because he took on a more noble profession. They're just facts. Cain worked the ground. Abel worked the animals. And the only description we get is that Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought to the Lord of the firstborn of his flock, and of their fat portions. That's the description we get. So, so likely one of two things going on here in, in the, the description of what happens between Cain and Abel. Either Cain should have known better, and he should have, he should have traded with Abel. He should have given him some vegetables so that Abel could give him a lamb to slaughter. So maybe, maybe Cain should have known that it was more appropriate to sacrifice an animal. There's that, that option, or it's in this description that, that Abel brought the first fruits. He brought the fat portions. And I, I don't know what the, what the fat portions equivalent of vegetables would be, but, but maybe Cain just didn't give the, the, the best in his sacrifice to the Lord. It wasn't the, the straight carrots, the, the big plump vegetables. He didn't offer that, that, that equivalent. In either case, God is gentle with Cain. Do you notice that in Genesis chapter 4? He corrects Cain. He teaches Cain in chapter 4. God says, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. And its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. See, God is addressing Cain's heart. He knows the battle that's going on in Cain's heart. It's not about vegetables and lambs. Sin is crouching at the door, Cain, and you must rule over it. But Cain, we see in how he responds, he wasn't foremost about pleasing the Lord. 
his sacrifice wasn't foremost about gratitude for the Lord's work in raising up the crop. What he was really concerned about was, was prominence over his brother, was approval from God. His desire wasn't to honor and to thank God. God says merely to do well and you'd be accepted. Bring a right sacrifice, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And with this brutal irony, Cain, rather than giving a right sacrifice, rather than sacrificing a lamb, he goes out into the field and he slaughters his righteous brother. Cain did not repent at the instruction and the correction of the Lord. He utterly rebels. The Lord says, do well, Cain, and he goes completely the other direction. You want a righteous sacrifice? Verse 8, when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And still the Lord protected Cain. Verse 16, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. Again, why does John take us back to this story? Why all the way back to Genesis 4? Because the hate of the world is not something that we're just dealing with afresh today. It's something that entered into mankind. It entered into the world from the beginning. Why did Cain murder his brother? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. You think your siblings and and you have, have some unique conflicts. This has been going on since the very first brothers on the earth struggled with jealousy and envy and anger. And God taught Cain. He instructed him to resist the devil and to turn from sin. And Cain chose his pride. And he dug his heels in, in his pride. He chose his sin and he killed his brother. They're not new problems. They're not new sins. John brings up this first murder to show that this disordered Love has been the problem since Adam, ever since Adam passed it to Cain. In Christ, God has made this way for us to no longer be characterized in selfishness, in self-serving motives in our love. God has worked in us in such a way that we can now offer a right sacrifice of thanksgiving through his Son, not because of any expectation of reward, like like Cain, but from hearts of gratitude, of grateful worship, like righteous Abel, who gave of the first fruits, as well as the fat portions, not, not expecting that God would give increase on account of the sacrifice, but acknowledging in the sacrifice that God is the one who had given the increase already, trusting in his faithfulness that he'll be the one who continues to give increase. So we too, by God's grace, we can love. We can love the way that God has called us to love as an overflow of thanksgiving. And this gratitude, John writes, is is utterly foreign to the world that we live in. It was foreign to Cain. It was incomprehensible to him. It is incomprehensible to the world. And John has experienced that firsthand as the world around him rose up and murdered the Messiah. And then, as the world rose up and murdered his friends, persecuted his Christian brothers and sisters, he saw it in his own life. We don't, we don't think that John was likely martyred, but he was certainly persecuted and exiled in his lifetime. He saw the hatred of the world just as Jesus had prepared him for Here John says in verse 13, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. It should not be a surprise. And John writing this here should sound familiar to us because it's exactly what Jesus had taught the disciples the night before he was arrested, the night before he was going to be crucified. He gave them the same warning. He told them, John 15, 18, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, The world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why? 
Does the world hate you? Because of Genesis 3. Because the offspring of the serpent are at enmity with the offspring of the woman. Because the children of the devil hate the children of God. Because the world is at enmity with Christ. Therefore, if we are in Christ, the world will hate us. And how will they know us? How will they know who to hate? How will they know who to fire their darts at? How will the world know who to rise up against and, and slaughter in the field? John 13, 35. They will know you by your love for one another. By our set-apart, otherworldly, holy love. The world is, is destined for death. They're on a broad way that leads to destruction and darkness, and they cling to the temporary thrills and the vanishing delights of this creation. Not so for the righteous. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Passing out of death into life. We know that we've passed out of death into life. This is, this is new birth. This is that new life that we've been talking about. This is, this is being born again. At one time you were dead in your trespasses. But now we are made alive together with Christ. And the fruit of that life is love. We no longer hate our brothers. And John brings into our minds through this the teaching of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. I hope, as a side note, as you're reading through 1 John, I hope you continue to flip through the Gospels, particularly keep John's Gospel open next to it, and you'll see it's, it's amazing how saturated John's mind is with the words of Jesus. He doesn't let go of the words of Jesus. And through this letter, what he's teaching is, again, no new commandment. He's He's encouraging us and refreshing us and, and challenging us in what we already heard from Jesus. And here he's, he's bringing them this, this reinforcement of the Sermon on the Mount. He says it's, it's, it's not enough to say, well, well, at least I haven't murdered anybody. I could do better, but at least I haven't killed anybody. I'm not as bad as Cain, at, at least. But John says everyone who hates his brother is a murderer already. And he might as well be quoting Jesus here. Jesus said in Matthew 5.21, You've heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders is liable to judgment. And then Jesus clarifies that command, and he draws out the heart of that command in the next verse. He says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. We already saw in chapter 2, verse 11, 1 John, Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. It's not that Christians are, are, are just able to show the self-restraint to refrain from murder. That's not what he's getting at here. It's not, it's not even that Christians have the ability to have the self-restraint to stay out of fights and to bite our tongues and, and to keep our cool. Even though Christians should be able to do those things. Certainly, we should... We should we should avoid these things. We're able, by God's grace and by His Spirit working in us, to become mature, to grow up in all things into Christ likeness. But the point here is not simply that Christians must behave. Of course, He is using behavior and has been throughout the letter, behavior as one of these assurances for the believer that if, if you have a changed heart, if you have this new life in you, it will produce a different kind of living and that fruit that you see in your life, it, it should be a real encouragement to you. But in the same way, the point is not just the fruit, but, but what the fruit points to. As the old adage goes, if, if there's trouble in the fruit, look to the roots. At least I think that's how it goes. At least that version rhymes. But if there's trouble in the fruit, you need to look to the root. The point is, if, if you've got a tree that's putting out bad fruit or no fruit, uh, your investigation should take you to the tree's roots. You don't just look at the apples. You don't just spray the apples or cover them or, 
or put up scarecrows or something. You need to check what's going wrong with your tree. You've got a, 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 a tree with a health problem in the roots. Now, on the contrary, if the tree is producing a heavy crop, lots of good, big, sweet apples, it's, it's not just because of the fruit in and of themselves, but what you've got is a healthy tree. Got strong roots, living roots that are pulling all the water and the nutrients up out of the soil. Likewise, the Christian. If we are truly changed, if we're given this new life, we will produce a heavy crop. We'll live fruitful lives. And yet the Christian has no room for boasting in that because the fruit is not something that we could have produced if it were not for the life flowing through the roots. Ephesians tells us that we were dead. To press the analogy a little bit, we were like snags. We were just standing dead tree trunks, just waiting to fall on somebody's fence or something. We were dead, like dead vines. I have some vines in my backyard that I planted two years ago. And everything else in my backyard is, is springing back. I've got my, our, our apple tree is starting to turn green. The grass is mostly t- starting to turn green again. Everything's getting green except these vines, which are just these brown kind of papery sticks now sticking up in the backyard. I'm pretty sure the vines are dead. They may be dead. They're, 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 they're dry, they're brown, no leaves, no fruit. And we all formerly were dead. It's evident in our fruit, evident in our lack of growth, our lack of, 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 of good works, our lack of love. But God makes believers alive. And Jesus said that a branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine. It gets its life from the vine. And neither can we bear fruit, do the work and the living and the, the life of, of love apart from Christ in us. And this is where the assurance of this statement comes from. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. This love is fruit. And fruit is dependent on life. The opposite is true. If my grapevines don't give me a single bud all summer, I don't get a single bud shooting off any place on the vine, those vines are dead. No fruit, no life. Now, if I get one bud somewhere down by the ground where it's coming up out of the ground, I've got some life and I got a lot of pruning to do. I got to cut those things way back because there's a lot of dead vine, but there's some life in there. Apply that to the Christian life. Okay, if there's some fruit, there's some life in there. And you might have a lot of pruning to do, but it's alive. But if there is no fruit, there is no life. No fruit, no life. John says no murderer, that is, nobody who hates his brother has eternal life abiding in him. Whoever does not love abides in death. But those who are alive in Christ, they live out a Christ-like love, which the world rejects, a love which the world tries to, to strangle out. Those who are alive in Christ, they live out a set apart, holy love. But what, is that, what does that actually look like? We've got our negative example in Cain. And our passage gets more specific for us as we go along. So we are to live a, a set-apart love. And our example of that is, is Christ. And that example is of a sacrificial love. That's our second description of, of the Christian's love. It is a set-apart love, and it is sacrificial Verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And this is the example that we have of love. John recalls Jesus' words once again, this time from his own gospel, from John chapter 10. In verse 10, uh, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. Verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Jesus came as this great shepherd of the sheep to gather his people, to gather those who were chosen by God, appointed to salvation, these lost sinners 
who are awaiting a Savior, and Jesus comes, and He is that Savior. He has come that these sheep may have life, and that they may have it abundantly. Because of our own sin, we were headed for death, not life. We were condemned in our sin. We were dead. And the great exchange of the gospel is that Jesus came as a substitute to offer up his righteous life in substitution for our sinful lives. To give life to those who were spiritually dead. And he did it because he loves us. Jesus didn't say, watch closely what I'm about to do for you so that you may know just how much you owe me. His intent was not that he would buy our loyalty so that we would be ready and prepared to fulfill our obligation in his future time of need. He didn't lay his life down out of some kind of self-interest to gain something. And we see this so simply declared here in the way that John finishes this sentence. He didn't lay his life down out of unwilling obedience to the Father. It's not, as some have recently argued, a case of some cosmic child abuse where the Father is making the Son go and and lay his life down. But John writes, By this we know, love, that he laid his life down for us. According to verse 16, just verse 16 What did he lay his life down for? For you. And what does that show us about him? According to verse 16. Love. Shows us love. In this verse right here, we see that Jesus went to the cross for you. He bore the scorn of the children of the devil and the scorn of some who were his own, the scorn of those who didn't know it yet, but who were, who were mocking him and, and pushing him to the cross, who were participating in his murder, only to find out shortly thereafter that he had gone to that death willingly for them. He came and he taught and he prayed and he wept and he suffered and he died for you. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. And it's not because of of the end result of what he foresees for you. It's not because because he, he calculated the balance and your future glorying will be worth it. It's not because he sees your ministry plans and, and he decided, yeah, I'll, I'll buy that. It's not because of your gifts or your plans for your ministry or for your business or for your generosity or how you're going to serve him later that he saved you. He didn't die for your ministry. He didn't die for your business. Jesus came to suffer and to die in order to gather the lost, to give them life, His life, and if you are a recipient of that gift, if you have put your trust and your hope and your affections in Jesus, it is because He came, He walked this earth, He lived and He died and He rose again. He did it all. He paid for every sin. He laid down His life because He loves you. The love of Christ we see in this verse is a self-sacrificing love. And the evidence is summarized in this. Here's here's what Christian love looks like. Turn your eyes to Jesus and see how he loves us. He laid down his life for us. Look at the shocking conclusion to this sentence. The second half of that sentence is that this love is our example. He laid down his life for us and we ought to lay our lives down for the brothers. Christ's sacrifice was ultimate, and our sacrifice is to mirror the heart of that sacrifice. Thankfully, Jesus Jesus did pay it all. We're not called to go to the cross. We're not called to go and and substitute our, our filthy rags for someone else's. We're not called to go and pay for others' 
sin, to die in their place. And John helps to clarify that in verse 17, that this is a a principle of sacrifice, that we are to see what Jesus has done and and mirror it in in principle. We're, We're not being commanded to lay our lives down in the same way that the shepherd laid down his life for the sheep on a cross to pay for sin. But verse 17, we are to lay our lives down in practical ways for one another. The principle can be, can be seen in Jesus' ministry throughout his life. Uh, here's, here's one image for us that, that can summarize how this principle plays itself out. Remember in the, in the Gospel of John when Jesus was dying on the cross and you have these soldiers who are, who are gambling over his clothes off to the side and Jesus looks down and he sees his mother standing next to John, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he said, John 19, 26, woman, Behold your son. He looks at John and he says, Behold your mother. From that hour, it says, the disciple took her to his own home. Jesus, even as he's dying, even as he's laying his life down for his sheep, he turns to one of them and he basically says, Now now you lay your lives down for one another. You imagine... Mary's heartache that night. You put yourself in Mary's shoes for the next 24 hours. How how dark and horrifying that day was and how, how dark and frightening the next day would have been. And imagine the tender care that Jesus would have given to her if it had been one of her other sons. And Jesus had been there with his mother. And now he's handed that to John in his absence. He effectively tells them from the cross, look around, look to one another, look in each other's eyes and see each other's sorrow and hurting and needs and lay your life down. And we, as disciples at the foot of the cross, as those who look to Jesus at the foot of the cross are to look around. We are to look to one another. Look into one another's eyes and sorrows and hurting and needs and lay your lives down for one another. This is the example that we have in Christ who gave his life for our greatest possible need. And now we are to love one another in just this way. We sacrifice. We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our pleasure, our comforts, our desires, our goals, even our ambitions. We sacrifice to meet the needs of others. To care for one another. Imagine what it meant for John to take Mary as his mother in Jesus' absence. Certainly there would be physical needs that he would need to be providing for. In modern terms, he would be, he's taking on a dependent into his home, it says. But but think of the the spiritual care that Jesus is telling John to to care for his mother in his absence. Love her and serve her. John took her into his home. He would lay his life down for her. How are you laying your life down for one another as we're commanded in this passage? Are you sacrificing to show the love of Christ for his sheep? Remember his question to Peter in John 21. Jesus asks him, do you love me? And Peter's hurt by the repeated question. He gets it. And he's asked as many times as he's denied, as he's denied Jesus, he's asked if he actually loves him. He says, yes, Lord. And Jesus says, then tend my sheep. If it's true that you love me, feed my lambs. And if you're struggling for motivation to do so, look to Christ, who calls to us from the Scripture, just as he called to John and Mary from the cross, see with what love the Father has loved you. Now you lay down your lives for one another. What exactly does that look like? Again, thankfully we're not called to die a substitutionary death on a cross, So what does it mean to lay our lives down? We have this example of 
of John and, and Jesus' mother, Mary. But is this just about willingness? Is it a general posture of the heart that as long as you can say, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd die if I had to, is that enough? In these last verses, John describes this love as active and practical. A third description is this love is sincere, verses 17 and 18. It cannot be a love in word only. But it is a love which shows itself true by its action. In our scripture reading this morning, we were reading in James. He says, if, if someone is in need and you say, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and you don't do anything, if you have the means to provide for their warming and their filling, but you just give them these sort of empty well wishes with your mouth, and you do nothing for them. I love how James concludes that sentence. What good is that? This is the appearance of faith, but James says faith without works is what? Dead. John puts it this, this way in verse 17, that if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet he closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Between James and John here, the scripture says that failing to love one another with a love that works is to have a faith that is dead, is to have a heart that is empty of the love of God. It is not enough to say, go in peace. Not enough to say, when it really matters, when it really counts, sure, yeah, I would lay my life down for you. If you don't lay your life down for others, now, if you don't lay your life down in, in small ways, in simple ways, then it simply isn't true of you that, that the love of God is abiding in you, that you love the brothers. And the one who sees a brother in need, any, any kind of need, all kinds of need, and closes his heart, says that one doesn't have the love of the Father in him. Don't close your hearts to one another. Don't let yourself get by with mere words. Don't be deceived. Anyone who hates his brother is not walking in the light. Anyone who closes his heart, how does the love of God abide in him? It doesn't. It can't. So how do you grow in this love? Not the love of the world, but this, this set-apart, sacrificial sincere love. How do you become sanctified? You look to Christ. You take in more of Christ. You behold Christ. And as you look to Christ, as you learn him, as he's revealed himself to us in his word, as you think on him, as you accept more and more the, the grace of the love of Christ for you, for what he's done for you, you'll look to one another. You'll look at these fellow, broken, sinful Brothers and sisters, you'll look to your right and left at the foot of the cross and remember the words of Christ. Behold your mother. Behold your son. Behold your brothers and sisters. And you'll stoop down and you'll wash her feet. You'll speak the truth in love to one another. You'll serve with one another. You'll give with no expectation of reward. You'll serve with no hidden desire for the praise of others. You won't hesitate to share your heart, to share your food, to share your home when you, when you have already taken in the riches that are yours because of the boundless love of Christ. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Look to your example in Christ, whose love didn't stop at words. He gave up every imaginable comfort. He gave up every deserved dignity. He gave up every, uh, every comfort and, and wealth and prestige deserved of, of the Prince of Glory, the King of Kings. Everything that the Son of God was entitled to, he emptied himself of in this life, on this earth, and he poured himself out for you. And here's the assurance that when you look to Jesus, 
and your heart is filled with gratitude, and when you're filled up at the thought of what he's done for you, of his selfless, undeserved love for you, and you go out and you love your brothers and sisters, not coldly because of some command, but because it's the most natural response to what he's already done for you. When you love in this way, it is only because God's love abides in you. 1 John 2.10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. It is because you are his child and he loves you. So go love one another like his children, in deed and in truth. By this it is evident who are the children of God. Pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful assurance of a passage like this and the profound challenge of it. We thank you that we can be comforted that when we love on account of what you've done for us, it is is because of what you've done for us. And you give us these comforts in your word that we we can take comfort. We thank you for the work of Christ. We praise you for this great plan of salvation for this undeserved grace of bringing sinners to yourself. We pray that you would protect us from boasting in any way in our works, but that you would help us to remember that it is by grace that we've been saved. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Christ, for his love for us, that he laid down his life willingly, and that he laid down his life for us. By this, we know love. We pray now that you would help us to be mirrors of that love, that we would love one another as you've commanded and as you've loved us. We pray that you would help us, strengthen us. In Jesus' name, amen.